Hey everybody, it's Jordan with Warp Fire Minis. Uh, today we're talking about Skaven. Uh, they were my first Warhammer army. They're my favorite Warhammer army. So let's dive into what makes Skaven great. So let's start off with the strengths and weaknesses of Skaven. Um, the biggest strength is we have all of the options. If we want to build into heavy spell casting, we've got it. If you want to have a bunch of melee hammer units, we've got it. Uh, if you want to be a big shooting army, we can do that too. So a lot of armies, they're kind of pigeonholed in where they can only do one thing great, but we can do all of the things, which makes for a really fun, engaging army to play. Um, other than that, Skaven, like, we're the rats. We've got a bag full of tricks. So we can teleport through gnaw holes. We can scurry away from combat with our heroes. We can cast Death Frenzy and fight when we die. Um, we can cast Skitter Leap and teleport again. So you just got a lot of tricks that you can do, keep your opponent on their toes. So again, just makes for a really fun army to play. Then on the weakness side of things, the whole army's pretty frail. So we can dish it out, but we just can't take it back. Like clan rats, if somebody hits them with one of their good units, like they're all going to die. Our vermin lords, if it gets hit by a big hammer unit, it's probably gonna die. So you really have to position things very carefully and keep that in mind. Because not only are we frail, we also have really bad bravery. So like if 10 clan rats die, a bunch more are gonna run away unless you save that command point. And you can only do that for one unit. So if you lose, lose multiple models and multiple units, like you have to be prepared for your stuff to run away. So again, just positioning is the key. Um, then other than that, the biggest weakness for this season is we have really bad book battle tactics and our grand strategies are just terrible. So you're gonna be playing games and a lot of armies, they're gonna have book battle tactics that just feel like they're free. Like they're not having to do anything hard and they get it. Where for Skaven, we have to like specifically build into them. And even then they're kind of sketchy. So like you can cast or chant three different prayers with Plague Priest as one of them. And like, that's our best one, but that requires bringing three Plague Priests. And like, that's a heavy investment just for a battle tactic. So. That's the weaknesses, that's what we gotta work with. So I wanna run through some of the standout units for Skaven. And if your favorite unit's not on this list, like it doesn't mean it's bad, it doesn't mean it's terrible. Um, the beautiful thing about Warhammer is there's plenty of different ways to play. So like, I'm gonna give you my opinion on what I think is great. Um, if you wanna use something else, go for it. It's gonna work out for you. But let's go through a list of what I think are the standout units for Skaven. First up's gonna be the MVP of the Skaven book. It's Thankwall and Bone Ripper. So every Skaven list I make, like this guy is the first thing I put in there. And right now you can't mention Thankwall without also bringing up Lotch on the Soul Seeker. That's an endless spell that helps him teleport around. And so what makes Thankwall so good is he has an innate plus three to cast and to unbind. And if you're standing next to a gnaw hole, now that's a plus four, which is just crazy strong. So it means anytime you go to cast your spell, it's probably going to go off. And then anytime your opponent wants to cast a spell, you're probably going to unbind it, which is just extremely powerful. So that alone would make for a really good unit, but you can also equip him with four of the warp fire projectors. And with Lotch on, that's letting him teleport. And so his flamethrowers, they have an eight inch range, which is the downfall. But what Lotch on does for you, it lets you teleport him up. So like that is no longer an issue. You can teleport up 18, you can still move another 10 inches, and then you roast whatever you want to. So with the four projectors, you're gonna average out two mortal wounds per model in the unit. So you just walk up to anything, if it's got one wound, like it's definitely all of them are dead. If they've got two wounds, like you're still on average wiping them all out, which is just an incredible amount of damage. That means like you walk up to a squad of 30 of the new blood letters that have two wounds apiece. Like that's the, their big hammer unit that can kill anything you have. Thankwall can just walk up by himself and kill all 60 wounds with one shot, which I think that makes Thankwall a great addition to any Skaven list. Next up, we're gonna talk about the Vermin Lords. So the three that I wanna bring up, you have the Vermin Lord Warbringer, who I think is the best one. We have the Deceiver, and then we also have Lord Screech, the named Vermin Lord. And so the Warbringer, what makes him so good um, you want to give him the Devious Adversary Command Trait, which gives him an extra two to his attacks characteristic, as long as he's fighting within three inches of something that hasn't fought yet. Um, and then you also want to give him the Warpstone Charm. You could give him one of the other ones to make him more defensive, but I like to just make him go out there and get something. 
So the Warpstone Charm gives everybody minus one to save if they're within three inches of him. So that, what that does, it makes all of his weapons rend three and anything else you have in combat near him, like you're getting an extra rend. So if you have Rat Ogres, they're rend one, now they're gonna be rend two, which is just great. Um, the Warbringer, he's gonna go in and on average, he's doing 20 plus damage. So three of your battle tactics, or maybe even four, are gonna involve killing something. And so this guy can go out there and he can kill something every time. He gets to reroll wound rolls if he's within 13 inches of three other Skaven units, which also includes himself. So you just need two other units within 13 of him, which again, just makes him incredibly consistent. Um, his command ability can also give himself plus one to hit and plus one to wound, which again, like we're twos and twos, like we're just, we're just chewing through them. Um, then his spell is like even better. Uh, it's called the Dreaded Death Frenzy. The only bummer is it casts on a seven, so you're not always gonna get it, um, but you do wanna start him out near gnaw holes to get him plus one to cast, so it's on a six. But then you get to pick D3 units to fight on death. And since it's D3, if you roll a three, for example, you can pick a unit multiple times. So he could give himself two stacks of Death Frenzy and give someone else one. And what that does is whenever he goes out and he dies, like now you get to fight twice, to a maximum of twice in a phase. So if he goes up and he kills something in the combat phase and then dies back, he's not gonna get to fight two more times, it's just once. But let's say you make it to the next turn, the enemy charges you and kills you, now he gets to fight twice. And since he does so much damage, like whatever just killed him, like he's gonna kill it right back. And getting good trades is really important for Skaven because again, we're frail, we've got Brad Bravery, like we need to make sure if we die, we're, we're killing something with us. After that, we have the Verminlord Deceiver. He doesn't do as much damage, but his spell is also incredible. It's called the Dreaded Skitterly. It casts on a six, and you get to pick any Skaven hero. Uh, I think it's within 13, and you get to teleport him. And normal teleport abilities are gonna be within nine inches. You gotta stay outside of nine of an enemy, but this one lets you set up outside of six. So it just makes it to where you can teleport that Warbringer, for example, six inches away from the, your opponent's most important piece and then just delete it, which is, again, an incredible ability. Um, he doesn't do as much damage, so like standalone, he can go out, he's got a Doomstar he can throw, it's pretty neat. Um, he's got Rend 3, which is good. He can teleport himself around, like you could go kill other GCs or little foot heroes and stuff he's gonna be able to do. You just don't wanna throw him into that 60 wound of blood letters, like he's gonna, he's gonna die. Um, and then after that, we have Lord Screech. And he's a good middle ground, like he does not as much damage as the Warbringer, but he does do a lot of damage. And he also has a really cool spell um, that casts on an eight. And you get to pick an enemy unit, roll 13 dice, and on a four up, you do a mortal wound to him, which is a great thing. You're gonna do six or seven mortal wounds pretty reliably. But then you also get to summon a unit of clan rats with however many models is how many mortal wounds you inflicted. So if you did seven mortal wounds, that's a little squad of seven clan rats, which doesn't seem like much, but having little units around, like it is, it is that much, like it's incredible. Um, your grand strategy you're gonna take most of the time is take what's theirs. And so that's just an extra unit. You can just run it to the enemy back line, help you score your grand strat. And on that side of things, we need all the help we can get. After that, let's go into the Gray Seer. Um, he's 130 points, but he's a two cast wizard. So for the value, like that's great. And what he does for us even more so is if you have three Master Clan heroes in your army, you unlock something called three claw steps. And what that does is it, it lets you, the first run roll you make, you can use that for the rest of your army. Like that's pretty good. But the best one is the first charge roll you make. So let's say you roll your first charge with a group of clan rats that don't matter, and you roll a 10. Now your whole army can charge 10. They can use that same roll, which helps you like if you used a regular skitter leap and you're nine inches away, now he's making it in. If you used your gnaw hole to teleport a unit, now they're in too. So it, it helps the reliability of getting the charges in. Like normally a nine is really, really bad. It's hard to get. But with three claw steps in the equation, you can roll that first roll. If it's bad, we can spin a command point and re-roll it and then use that for our whole army. And then if that one's bad, like when you can make it to that unit that needs the nine, you get to roll again to try. So it, it, I forget the odds, it's somewhere around 75% or something where if you can get one unit in that way, 
which is just really good for a nine inch charge. Um, he's also, once per turn, he can do a 3d6 cast. And if you roll 13 total, um, he gets to automatically cast it. It can't be unbound and he takes D3 mortal wounds. And so sometimes that can be spicy versus something like Techless that can automatically unbind a spell. So if you want to go up there, cast a Warp Lightning Vortex in his space and you roll that 13, like that feels great. They can't stop it. It's going to, going to proc do a bunch of stuff to him. Um, other than that, if you don't roll the 13, you get to pick the top two dice and you use those to cast the spell, which again just makes him a really good spell caster. Uh, we run a, a lot of endless spells. His War Scroll spell is good. Then just having somebody cast Mystic Shield or something with that second spell is really good. We're going to bundle the next few together. We've got the Engineer, the Bombardier, and the Arch Warlock. And so all three of those are little Scryer Wizards. And the Engineer is the cheapest one. Um, he's the worst one, but he is the only one that can overcharge Warp Lightning Cannons. So if you want to bring Warp Lightning Cannons, you are required to bring this guy. He's what makes them good. The Bombardier, if you're running Jezails and stuff like that, um, he can still eat the Warpstone Spark, give everybody the plus one to damage, which is the important part. But then he's got his own little rocket launcher himself that's really fun. Um, you can overcharge it and do D6 attacks, and if he eats a Spark himself, it can be four damage. So I've shot him one time into a group of three Varengard and just wiped him out, which I was pumped, my opponent was not. Um, but it was a good time. And then the Arch Warlock, he has the better spell, uh, Warp Lightning Storm. You can do mortal wounds to a big area of things. Um, but he's the most expensive. Um, he's also the most durable. So if you're having a lot of issues with your Bombardier dying or your regular Engineer dying and you're running Jezails, um, he's going to stay alive better. He's got a three up save. And he can do like a decent, he's got a decent melee profile. He can do a little bit of damage there. Um, but I, I find myself like, I'm normally going the Engineer or the Bombardier myself, depending on which shooting option I'm running. After that, let's talk about the Master Molder. Um, he's our Clan Molder uh, hero, and he's incredible. Like, I love the Master Molder. Uh, you pair him up with Rat Ogres or Giant Rats, anything like that. But what he does is it's, it's not a roll, it just automatically happens. At the start of your movement phase, you pick a unit, I think it's within 13, wholly within 13, and you can whip him and the whip gives them plus three to their charge rolls and plus one to their two wound rolls, which is just awesome. And he only costs 90 points, extremely cheap. For this season, we want to bring little foot heroes anyways, the GCs, to try and score Cunning Maneuver or one of the other two GC tactics. Um, but the tactic is, so he whips the Rat Ogres, let's say. Then we teleport them through a gnaw hole on the other side of the board. Now they're nine inches away from an enemy. So instead of needing that nine, now we can. We only need a six now, which again is, is pretty reliable. You can try and get a foot hero or one of the vermin lords nearby so they can re-roll it. And six inch re-rolling, like they're gonna make it in. They're gonna do some pretty good damage. And then let's say it goes bad. The opponent kills him. The master molder, whenever that unit dies, you get to spin a command point and roll a dice. And on a three up, the entire unit comes back. So if you're running a squad of four rat ogres, it's 24 wounds on a four up save. They do good damage. Like for them to go in, hit, do damage, and then die, and then come right back. Like it's awesome. So Master Molder, thumbs up. Then we're making it to the Plague Priest. This will be the last little foot hero we talk about. But you can run three of them to try and score that battle tactic I mentioned earlier. If you chant three prayers, you score your battle tactic. It's not the best, but there are things we can do to make it more reliable. So. Whenever you're chanting a prayer, if you roll a six or above, you get to trigger a great plague in addition to the regular prayer. And so there's instances like turn one, you've got one set up next to the gnaw hole. They get plus one to the chanting rolls if they're near other plague priests too. And so turn one, if we have them all near each other, we can try and trigger the great plague that lets you re-roll chanting rolls for the rest of the game. So with all of those things in combination, like we can make that a reliable battle tactic, which is good. Um, the Great Plagues, there's the one that lets you reroll the chanting rolls is great. Uh, the Bubonic Plague does 2d6 mortal wounds to something. Then like if that unit is destroyed with that, it can trigger down the line and like hit other units if things keep dying, which is like 2d6 mortal wounds rules. Um, then there's another one, the Red Maw Plague, you can cast on an enemy hero. And then if, if they're within three inches of their own units, like you can use their hero to attack their own stuff for the rest of the game, which again, pretty cool. Um, they just have to be within 13 inches is the hard part. 
Um, all the all the plagues, they have a 13 inch range. So you gotta kind of scoot them up there and go for it. But plague priests, they're pretty good. Now we're making our way down to some of our battle line choices for the army. Uh, we have to bring three to every game. So clan rats versus storm vermin. Uh, that's the normal debate people have. And the clear winner is clan rats. Every time go clan rats. Don't even think about storm vermin, clan rats. You're gonna wanna bring two, at least two units of clan rats in, in every list you have. They're just like the best battle line unit in the game for the points. Like it's 100 points, you're getting 20 little dudes. They do zero damage. You don't want them in combat. If they're in combat, retreat out because every battle shock phase you regenerate D3 of them. So like you wanna do whatever you can do to try and keep this unit alive so that it just slowly regenerates and is a pain for your opponent. Like keep the clan rats alive, they're awesome. Uh, Storm Vermin, if you do want to run them, they're really cool models. Uh, they're threes and threes, rend one, one damage. Like their profile is good. Um, just they're one wound a piece. There's a lot of damage floating around the game. So if you've got a big block of 20 or 30 of them you're using as your hammer unit, if they get in first, they're going to do damage. It's going to feel good. But if you get hit first, like they're just all going to die. Um, and that feels bad. Like if, if your strategy relies on this one unit and they're all dead, like it's hard to win games, um, but they can do damage. If you get Death Frenzy on them, like now if they die, at least you're gonna kill something back. But for me, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing clan rats, like two units of clan rats, every list. If you want more, get more, but at least two. Then if we're bringing our Plague Priest, this makes the Plague Sensor Bears battle line. But even if they're not battle line, they're still worth bringing. Uh, they're threes to hit, threes to wound. They have rend one and they're two damage each. Um, when they charge, they're doing four attacks per model. So even a little squad of five for 90 points, like that's 20 attacks at threes, threes, rend one, two damage, which is just a really, really good investment for your points. Like you're getting a good return on that every time. So Plague Sensor Bears, if you've got the room, like sneak a couple in there. After that, we've got Gutter Runners and Night Runners. Uh, they're the little ninja rats and they're really neat. I like the Gutter Runners better than Night Runners myself, but both are, are have their uses. The gutter runners, their whole thing is that they can deep strike. So you have to bring them in turn one, but they set up wholly within six of a terrain feature and outside of nine of enemies, which means just you're gonna be able to set them up. They have a 12 inch shooting range. And so you're gonna be able to set them up and shoot the opponent. Um, the deal is they have three attacks each on their shooting attacks and sixes to hit our mortal wounds. So they hit on fours, wound on fours, the one damage each, no rend. The, the regular damage you're not worried about, you're really fishing for sixes. So you can bring a 10 block of these guys or even 15 if you make them battle line, if you have a Deathmaster hero. But you're just rolling a ton of dice. You're, you're gonna proc a bunch of mortal wounds. You try and set them up like where if the opponent charges them afterwards, you're gonna unleash hell. Or if you have Thankwall nearby, you can double unleash hell, um, which just helps them stay alive. Uh, Cause they do have a, a bad save, bad bravery. Like you don't want them to get hit. They can do like a, a lot of damage. Like they can really, really put a hurting on something. So they're worth bringing for sure. Then the, the Night Runner variant, they also do a mortal wound on the six to hit, but they just do less attacks and they have to start on the board. And they're frail, they have bad bravery, but before the game starts, you get to roll 2d6 and you can move that unit that far. So there's some sneaky things you can do with that to like help you set up a turn one desecrate, like just run them way far up there and they can still run and shoot. And then you can also do things like run them up onto an objective to make it harder for your opponent to score a turn one battle tactic. So they do have their use. They just don't do, do as much damage as the gutter runners. So I'm gonna stick with gutter runners myself. Then we're coming down to rat ogres. Uh, I love rat ogres. We talked about master molder before where uh, if they die on a three up, the whole unit comes back. Um, if I'm bringing rat ogres, I normally bring a squad of four um, just that gives you enough punch to where like you can go charge them out of a knot hole into something and you're likely gonna clear it. And now your opponent has a problem. Like there's this big squad here, 24 wounds on a four up save. Like I, I can't ignore it or they're just gonna keep killing things and they're tough to take down. And if I do kill them on a three up, the whole squad comes back anyways. So rat ogres, like big thumbs up. I love them. Like I put them in most of my lists. Um, just you have to bring that master molder with them. Um, if you try and bring a squad of six, you can run into coherency issues and you won't be able to get all of them in. Um, and then a squad of two, they are still like, they still come back to life. They still do an okay amount of damage, but I think four is really that sweet spot. So after Rad Ogres, we have Storm Fiends. 
Um, these come in the Vanguard box, and Storm Fiends, they're incredible. Um, they're one of the best Skaven units if you build into it. Um, you don't want to bring a squad of three because they just don't do enough. But if you bring a squad of six Storm Fiends, they're going to be able to blast stuff off the board. If you bring a unit of nine Storm Fiends, like, that's the sweet spot for them. Um, you want to cast more and more warp power on them from one of your engineers um, or the Arch Warlock. And that gives them plus one to hit and plus one to wound. So just a ton of damage. Like we're talking, you do the more and more warp power, you eat the spark to give the rattling guns and the wind launchers plus one to damage. And now like they can walk up and pretty much delete anything in the game. Um, and like sometimes even two, like you're, you'll be able to go up and just delete two complete units with their just their shooting attack. Um, if you're gonna charge them into combat, you wanna make sure it's something you can kill. Because with all their shooting abilities, like you kind of want them to set up where the enemy has to charge you so that you can unleash hell on them again. And that, that makes it where a lot of things like they just can't charge in because they're going to die. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind, if you're gonna run nine Storm Fiends or six even, a lot of times it's good to bring the Soul Scream Bridge and that you have really good casters, so Thankwall can cast this or the Grey Seer on 3D6 can cast it. And it lets you teleport that unit around. Uh, the, the Rattling Gun has a 12 inch range, but we get to teleport outside of nine. So you can go blast something off the board and then the next turn just teleport them to the complete opposite side of the board and then wipe stuff out over there. Um, it's a really big point investment for a unit of nine. And so like when you're making that build, it's your only option. Like you have to keep this unit alive. If all nine of them go down, like you lose the game. But you get to choose how you locate your wounds. You can kill all the little melee ones first so that you keep the good shooting attacks. Um, and it's just a really powerful list. Uh, people, will, they'll, they'll try and make that into a one drop army and they'll go second so that they get a chance at a double turn. So if you go second, you're gonna blast something off the board or maybe two things. Then if you get the double, you're gonna go blast another thing or two things off the board and you're probably gonna win the game. Um, my only issue with Storm Fiends is all of last edition, so second edition, like Storm Fiends were the only way to run Skaven. So I personally just got burnt out on it, but they are an incredible unit. Like it's a great build. If you like the models, which they're super cool, like Storm Fiends, do six or do nine and you're gonna have a good time. Speaking of shooting, uh, the next things we've got, uh, the Warp Lightning Cannons and then the Warp Lock Jezails. So of the two, Cannons are my favorite. Um, I like to have fun, right? So it's always very exciting. The Warp Lightning Cannon, you get to roll a dice to set the power. And then you get to roll either six dice or 12 dice if you overcharge it. And you have to meet or beat that power level. And so what that means is if you're rolling that Warp Lightning Cannon dice and you roll a one and you overcharged, you're doing 12 mortal wounds to something, which just feels great. Um, the problem is if you roll a six, like you're rolling those 12 dice, you're gonna do two mortal wounds, maybe like you just blank and don't do any. And for that roll of the 12 dice, any ones that you roll, you take D3 mortal wounds back to yourself. So sometimes the cannons can go great. Sometimes you'll do no damage and blow yourself up. Uh, but that's Skaven, right? Like that's fun. Uh, the Jezails, like if you want more consistency, um, they can do it, but like there's no spikes. Um, they, they're gonna do two damage a piece if they get through. Um, you can eat a Warpstone Spark to make that three. Uh, six is to hit, do two mortal wounds. But on average, like with the buffs, the unit of three is gonna do four or five damage. Uh, that's your, kind of your average. Where the Warp Lightning Cannons, like when you're overcharging, you're gonna average out a seven. So we're almost doing double the amount of damage. Plus you get that fun, exciting roll. Like every, <laughs> every time you go to roll that power dice, you and your opponent are both holding your breath just to see what happens. So I'm on Team Warp Lightning Cannon, but Jezails, they're decent if that's what you're looking for. Uh, but you, without being able to shoot little foot heroes this season, that really hurt them. And they're artillery, so we can't put them into the Sharpshooter Battalion. So I used to run Jezails, pop little foot heroes with that little bit, little bit of damage, and it felt good. I was getting a good trade on my points. But without shooting heroes now, like Warp Lightning Cannons, that's where I'm at. Next up, we're gonna talk about our Endless Spells. Um, it's a big part of our army, so we have really good casting with Thankwall the Grey Seer. Uh, Lord Screech can be plus one to cast once per battle. Near Nahal, it's going to make him plus two, so plus two casting, also great. Um, we have the Warp Lightning Vortex, um, just a really, really good spell. 
It triggers when you cast it and again at the end of every movement phase. So that first turn you cast it, it's gonna proc twice. And it just has a huge range. So you set up the first node wholly within 13 of the caster. And then the next two nodes have to go seven inches away from that one. And then the other one has to go seven inches away. It has to form a triangle. But everything within six inches of that takes mortal wounds on a dice roll. That's a four up normally. If they're within range of two nodes, it's a three. If they're in range of two nodes, or all three nodes, it's on a two up. And then if you roll a six on that roll to see if you do any mortal wounds, it does D6 mortal wounds to them. So with that proccing twice, like there's a lot of times where let's say it's turn one, you teleport a gray seer with skitter leap up in front of the opponent's army. You can drop this warp lighting vortex and hit almost their entire army with this spell. And with it proccing twice, like there are times where you're just taking a big chunk out turn one. And now in the opponent's turn, that spell, it casts on an eight. So for them to unbind it, they need a nine, which is tough. And so it's now this big zone where like they don't want to move their units into that. So you can use it to block out parts of the board. So really, really good spell. A little bit hard to cast, but we've got good casters, so no big deal. Then the other one's Ravenax Gnashing Jaws. It's not technically in our army, um, but it's one of the universal endless spells. For this season, the focus is on the GCs, the Glacian Champion Foot Heroes. And so this spell, since we're good casters, it can go and just eat one um, pretty reliably. So you cast it on a six, we got that. You get to roll 3d6 to see how far it moves. And it does mortal wounds difference between how far it moved and the move characteristic of what the little foot hero. Most of your foot heroes are gonna move five or six. The average on 3d6 is 11. So we're gonna do five or six mortal wounds on average to them, which usually kills them. So with the focus on that this season, like I think Jaws, they're, they're too good to pass up right now. I, I would put them in pretty much all of my Skaven lists. Then honorable mentions. So there's a lot of things in the Skaven book that I didn't bring up. Like they're still good. Um, there's niche cases to make them all work. So things like Doom Wheel and a three claw steps list, they can do a bunch of mortal wounds. And we're talking like 43 a turn with all their movement shenanigans they do. So like they're good. You have Scryer Acolytes are really good just way too expensive, don't buy them, don't do it. Uh, warp grinders can deep strike a unit in, that can be really good with storm beans. Then even things like the hell pit abomination, just a 210 point monster, like he does good damage, he's hard to take out, um, he can bring himself back when he dies. So we've got tons of cool tricks, like Skaven, they're my favorite army. So those are my recommendations for Skaven. And again, like use whatever you think is cool, like that's the best thing to do. But if you build a list out of these units I mentioned, you're gonna have a pretty good chance to compete in your games. And if you look at the stats like Skaven, we're not top of the list, but we have really good units. Our battle tactics suck, but if you play them well, like you can compete with anybody. It's a great army, it's super fun to play, and it's just the coolest models in the game. So Skaven, that's it. Uh, if you guys have any other questions about Skaven, just drop them down in the comments. Uh, let us see what, what army you want to see next. And if you need any models, just go to warpfireminis.com. So thanks for watching.